Let's look at the fourth antinomy, the fourth conflict of the transcendental ideas. That sounds so fancy, doesn't it? But it's really, it's really not all that fancy. Uh, again, we're not trying to comprehend Kant's whole philosophy here. That would be impossible in a week. It would be impossible in a year. Uh, but um, the basics are not that difficult to understand. Tr transcendental means transcending our experience, the limits of our possible experience. And for Kant, again, there are always two components to all my experiences. On the one hand, uh, a sensuous component, my what he calls my intuitions, and, and that is the raw material. What I get normally, I say through my senses. Uh, it's the it's the content of my experience, and the second element is always concept. Kant believes that experience is always a construct of a certain kind, um, where we put together uh, experience, or we, excuse me, put together these intuitions, these sensuous intuitions, uh, with the concepts that order those sensuous uh, intuitions. So that experience itself is impossible without both. So these ideas, um, having to do with the beginning of the world, with the possibility of freedom, with the um, existence of a necessary being, all transcend, go beyond the limits of our possible experience. And they do so because we, we, we cannot have that sensuous component, we cannot have that intuitive component. All we have are these ideas that are like free-floating ideas. Uh, that we employ in Kant's kind of very natural way. We have the human reason, you might say, has a unifying uh, impetus, agenda, where reason tries to understand and, and draw the world of our experience together. And, and this works to a certain extent, but once we start to employ these concepts that try to unify and order our view of the universe, cosmos, everything, uh, once we try to employ them uh, freely without having to be part of some actual experience, then we go wrong. Let's look at the fourth conflict, the fourth antinomy. It's about God. Not by name, but certainly the thesis and the antithesis, the antithesis, the two opposing theses, uh, indicate that we're, they were, we're here on the territory of the theologians, of people like Anselm and Aquinas. The thesis there exists either in or in connection with the world, either as part of it or as the cause of it, an absolutely necessary being. And its antithesis, an absolutely necessary being, does not exist either in the world or out of it as cause. We won't go through the proofs of the contradictory theses uh, in, in total. There's no reason really to do that. Let's just get a sense of what Kant is doing here and what he's trying to show. The proof of the thesis that there is a, an absolutely necessary being, he calls that the cosmological argument, and think of the first three arguments of Thomas's five arguments for the existence of God as examples of the kind of proof that he's calling the cosmological proof. That is, where we look at the world, and on the basis of our experience of the world around us, we reason that there must have been an ultimate cause of that world. He says this, The world of sense, as the sum total of all phenomena, contains a series, series of changes. For without such a series, the mental representation of the series of time itself, as the condition of the possibility of the sensuous world, could not be presented to us. Uh, our experience of the world is an experience of changes, and uh, a series of changes. Uh, one thing follows another, and in a comprehensible way, he continues, but every change stands under its condition. That is, what is it that conditions it? What is it that, that, that causes it? Which precedes it in time and renders it necessary. That is, every, every state of the world is made uh, comprehensible by the state of the world before it that caused it to be as it is. Now, the existence of a given condition presupposes a complete series of conditions up to the absolutely unconditioned, which alone is absolutely necessary. That is, that we 
to understand uh, why the world uh, is ordered the way it is, uh, where everything is conditioned by what came before it, to account for the whole series of conditions, we have to have a starting point. We have to have an, an initial conditioner, like that unmoved mover of Aristotle. It follows that something that is absolutely necessary must exist if change exists as its consequence. It's very familiar Aristotle and uh, Thomas Aquinas in saying that if we're going to comprehend the way the world appears to us now, where everything is conditioned by something else, uh, put in motion by something else, caused by something else, uh, that we have to posit the beginning of the series and something that is absolutely necessary in order to um, make the whole series comprehensible. Now let's look at the antithesis that an absolutely necessary being does not exist either in the world or out of it as its cause. Grant that either the world itself is necessary or that there is contain contained in it a necessary existence, two cases are possible. First, there must either be in the series of cosmical changes a beginning, which is unconditionally necessary and therefore uncaused, which is at variance with the dynamical law of the determination of all phenomena in time. That is, we're granting an exception. If we say that there is a first beginning that was uncaused or unconditioned, we are granting an exception where, uh, to our notion that everything in nature is conditioned by something, that, that there is a cause of everything. Or, secondly, the series itself is without beginning, and although contingent and conditioned in all its parts, is nevertheless absolutely necessary and unconditioned as a whole, which is self-contradictory. That is, we may say that everything that happens in nature individually is contingent, accidental, conditioned by something else, but that the whole series is necessary. But that's contradiction because none of the parts are necessary, so how can the whole series be necessary? For the existence of an aggregate collection cannot be necessary if no single part of it possesses necessary existence. Grant, on the other hand, that an absolutely necessary cause exists out of and apart from the world. This cause, that the highest member in the series of the causes of cosmical changes, must originate or begin the existence of the latter and their series. In this case, it must also begin to act, and its causality would therefore belong to time, and consequently to the sum total of phenomena, that is, to the world. It follows that the cause cannot be out of the world, which is contrary to the cause. So, um, the second argument saying that if we do posit uh, some sort of unconditioned cause or necessary being um, that is not itself conditioned, we break our own rule of viewing the sensuous world, the world around us, the world of our experiences, always in whatever state it's in, whatever event happens, always being conditioned by something else. And as, excuse me for that, I'm checking the time. And if you look down at the observations on the fourth antinomy, he says, um, to demonstrate the existence of a necessary being, I cannot be permitted in this place to employ any other than the cosmological argument, which ascends from the conditioned in phenomena to the unconditioned in conception, the unconditioned being considered the necessary condition of the absolute totality of the series. Uh, and what do we do in the thesis? He says, uh, a little bit further down, but if we begin our proof cosmologically by laying at the foundation of it the series of phenomena and then regress in it according to empirical laws of causality, we are not at liberty to break off from this mode of demonstration to pass over to something which is not itself a member of the series. He calls this a saltus, or a leap in Latin, where we leap from viewing everything in the world as conditioned to saying, well, there must be some one thing that's unconditioned. And he says, on the antithesis, remarkably, the very same grounds of proof which established in the thesis the existence of a supreme being demonstrated in the antithesis and with equal strictness the non-existence of such a being. That is, when we observe the world as consisting of uh, events which are conditioned, we just make that same observation, and from one point of view we say, well, that must be accounted for by an unconditioned. From another point of view, we say, well, uh, it can't because everything in the world is conditioned, so we can't break our rules. So what is Kant showing there that, as he says at the end of the, his observation on the fourth antinomy, uh, it's like looking at uh, astronomy from uh, something in astronomy from different points of view. One thing will appear true from one position, from one intellectual position, 
will peer through from another intellectual